Hi, I'm Michael Goodfriend, executive producer of In the Cards. And I am Kevin Henderson, the writer and director of In the Cards. Kevin, I am very excited. Why? Because right now, waiting outside is the one and only Connor Ratliff of Dead Eyes fame and star of In the Cards. Oh my God. Do you, do you know how I feel right now? How do you feel? I, I, I feel kind of like how Connor Ratliff might have felt if Tom Hanks had ever been waiting outside of his studio to go in and do an interview for Dead Eyes. That's oh, how I feel. You look pretty excited. I am too. Connor, welcome. It's great to have you with us. I appreciate o only speculation, no spoilers. Like we should have a bell or some kind of thing that we can, you know, oh, yeah. sound so that people can turn it off and, and, or skip ahead. Connor, you are an actor, you're a comedian, you're based in New York city. How in the world did you ever decide to do a podcast called in the cards? You you very nicely asked me, and and that's all it takes. Uh, no, that's not that's not true because I, I I it's not like, and I don't say this as a as if I'm a super successful person, but uh, if I don't know the people involved, I always have to look at like uh, what the writing is, and a lot of times, if it doesn't speak to me immediately, like usually you can read about a page of anyone's writing and, and as an actor you can kind of tell like oh this probably isn't good and so usually I'll read through and if it's like hard usually if the writing is really hard to read or it's confusing you kind of take a second look to see is it hard because it's brilliant and I'm not getting it most of the time it's just hard to read because uh, it, there's something that's not working or it, it, it may not even be bad it just won't appeal to me and and uh I looked at the the scripts for in the cards and right away I was I thought oh this flows it it feels good and so you don't always know that something's good at first instance but you know if it's not good and and I knew instantly I'm like this is not not good this might even be good and then as I read more I thought getting a good feeling of like you know then you start getting nervous like something can be good for the first 20 pages and very quickly become not good so I was as I was reading through it I was like well, I hope this doesn't take a turn, and it never—it only took good turns. So I don't even know how many scripts did they end up uh, sending you. That's a great question. I think I read the first one, and I was pretty confident that like, there's no way that this first one's good, and the rest of them are bad. Usually, there's there's um, warning signs. There's little little um, uh, red flags here and there, and I didn't notice any red flags. So yeah, and so that's. Um, uh, I was very flattered that you thought of me for it, and and the, and then I also, you know, it was, you know, being able to um, act in this kind of medium. You know, I when I was a kid, um, my dad would um, play all these old radio comedy shows from when he was a kid, and so I listened as a kid. I listened to a lot of stuff that like other kids of my generation were not listening to. And I always had this kind of sad feeling of like, there were things that in the, what they used to call the golden age of radio, there were kinds of things that they would do that then when TV came along, um, the whole thing just disappeared. It was just like, why would you listen to a story if you could watch a story? And I always sort of felt like, ah, oh, I missed it. Like that would have been a fun medium to work in. And, um, and then with podcasts, I mean, I know, I know there have been audiobooks, but that's also a very different thing because it's very much tied to just like uh, it's a, an adaptation of a book as opposed to a pure kind of radio play. And so I'm always very excited when I get a chance to, to act in the audio medium. And, and in something like this, where you actually have an arc where you're actually able to have a character go through things and change and play different kinds of scenes and levels is uh, exciting. Had you been a fan of any podcasts prior to doing Dead Eyes? Um, yeah, I'm very bad at listening to podcasts because there's so many of them. And I used to, in the early days of podcasting, 
there were quite a few that I listened to, like literally in the, in the, the back when, you know, people forget, I think that they're called podcasts because of a machine that you can no longer buy. Uh, it's their name podcast because you listen to them on your iPod and, and we forget that, that it's like the, th- the thing that they were introduced on no longer, uh, is manufactured. But I used to work in a bookstore and my shift was early morning um, until the afternoon. So I had a few hours every morning where the store was closed, where I was just shelving books and organizing uh, things. And I could listen to, I, I would always have one earbud in and I would listen to podcasts and I would have several hours a day and a commute. And I no longer have a commute and I no longer have a job where I have several hours where I can just listen to stuff. So now when I listen to a podcast, I really have to sort of choose to listen to it. And it's, it's hard because there's so many great ones out there. It's, it's, um, it, there's, so many, there's so many overall, but there's also so many good ones that it's hard to find the time and the discipline to really listen to. And there's a lot that have been recommended to me that I um, you know, have on this list along with the many unread novels that I own. You know? Kevin, how about you? Were you a fan of podcasts prior to writing a podcast? Um, I was, but I was never listening to any of the uh, narrative fiction uh, podcasts. And um, a friend of mine, I, you know, I was very involved with, uh, with Avatar 2 and Avatar 3 as a performer. And um, when we were just sitting around on the stage, I was sort of grousing about the writer side of my life and trying to get, uh, you know, I thought, God, I, you know, I've written a, like a gazillion movies and, and TV pilots that are just basically sitting in a drawer collecting dust. I said, I'd love, to, I mean, I'd love to get something produced somehow. And this guy said, you should check out narrative fiction. And he's like, it's an, it's an, you know, relatively inexpensive way to put something together. Um, and I was like, Oh God, I've never even, I listened to podcasts, but I've never even come across them. So I did start to listen. And, um, the first ones that that grabbed me were Homecoming, uh, which was with Catherine Starr and Catherine Keener and David Schwimmer, which they ended up turning into a show on Amazon with um, Julia Roberts. Uh, I listened to that, and I started listening to an anthology series called The Truth, which Connor was, I think, a part of several of those, which is mm-hmm. a really wonderful anthology series. Uh, they're they kind of reminded me of Twilight Zone a little bit. Um, some of them were a little bit more serious. Some of them had humor. Uh, always consistently good. Um, and another one, Blackout. And when I was listening, I could see like the older ones, the the sound design may have been good, but not necessarily super comprehensive. And then when I started to listen to Blackout, I was like, wow, they're walking through the woods. You can hear the the leaves crunching under their feet. And that's when I, when I was formulating this idea, and I called our our uh, our sound designer Shane Reddig, and I said, "Look, no one's doing anything in the comedy lane. Everything's very serious, which is great. But the comedy lane's wide open, and nobody's and the ones that are comedy are a little bit more silly. Um, so I wanted to do something that had the super comprehensive sound design with scoring that was great." And, and to throw that into a comedy and uh, to try and define ourselves that way, which I, I've got to say, I'm I'm pretty damn happy with the way it all turned out. I think Shane did a fantastic job. Connor did a fantastic job. So, Connor, have you gotten to listen to any of it yet? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's interesting because you, you know, we recorded it at a pretty fast clip. Like we were coming in and just doing we're straight through like recording all day and, and once we had it, we had it and we're like moving on to the next thing. And out of sequence. And uh, it's it's funny because you're imagining the world and then you hear it. And, you know, like if you're filming something, you know, I'm a visual person, I think overall, you go on the set. I guess it's like filming something on a green screen or something where, well, we'll see it added in later, you know, that all of it's sort of in your mind and then to listen to it and suddenly um, there's a different, the the emotions are different, the mood, the vibe of a scene is different, you know, and um, and whatever was in your head when you were recording it, sometimes it's completely different than what you were imagining. It's interesting, like, when we started to do it, I, you know, I had a very clear idea 
of what it was going to be. So when you guys were recording the scenes, acting the scenes, like I had a 80%, 90% idea of what it, the end product was going to be. And I was trying to explain like while we were doing, I'm like, look, when this happens, some like Jason Bourne, like chase music, thriller music, it's going to happen when you're talking about making toast, you know, which sounds silly. So, so that does, I have been curious this whole time, uh, how, whether it ended up being anything like you guys had imagined and like I had tried to, to tell you it was going to be on the soundscape. Either way is fun because when, when it's, it's like, like wow, this is exactly, exactly what I pictured, pictured that's, that's fun. And, and when it's like, like, oh, I didn't, I didn't realize it would be this at all. Like there's, it's two different kinds of delightful. Yeah. I, uh, you know, I, I, it was more than I imagined surprising in that way, like stuff that I just was like, I didn't even really notice in our sound directions, like, or, or that, that became huge in production, you know, how operative uh, certain things like a bird <laughs> can be. Right. So, you know, my introduction to podcasts was way back in 2003 when <laughs> uh, a friend of mine, I had been working for air America radio. My brother uh, was a founder of the, um, the network, the liberal radio network, Air America Radio, that uh, launched the career of Rachel Maddow, believe it or not. And uh, after that tanked, one of my friends from that company said, hey, you do theater, right? And I was like, uh, yeah. He said, you like acting? And I was like, yeah. And he said, have you ever heard of the Gastineau girls? And I like, I pictured this, like, I don't know, it sounded French. Like the twenties or something like yeah, I was like oh, and... feather boas and things like that, and I was like no, and he said well, there's, there's it's like this mother daughter duo, and they're really funny and doing this reality thing, and they want to do a a podcast, and I was like what's that? And he kind of described it, and I kind of got it. He was like it's five grand. I was like I'm in five grand. <laughs> and so I started doing it. It was this reality series with these people that the the Gastineau girls, I guess. Uh, you know, the wife had the the mother had been married to some Jets football star. Football player, yeah, yeah. And let me tell you, that was, <laughs> was it was it was a hilarious and kind of rude introduction to what podcasts can be. But that was the year that Webster named podcast the word of the year. I don't remember what year what year was. I do remember because the Ricky Gervais had one of like the first like podcasts that sort of people took note of. And this was before he was quite as, like, notorious or divisive a figure on the pop culture uh, landscape. But I remember listening to the first episode of that in a Gristidi's grocery store. And there was a, there was a, it was the, it was a conversation with like him and Stephen Merchant and Carl Pilkington. And something struck me funny. And I started laughing. And I realized when you're wearing headphones and you're just in a grocery store and you start laughing at something, you just look crazy. And then when you can't stop laughing, because I started realizing, you know, <laughs> just seeing someone, even though you know oh, they must be laughing at what they're listening to, it still looks bonkers. Someone who's like waiting in line and just laughing. If somebody came to the future, like from the past, and saw us all walking around now, they'd think, I mean, we are all nuts compared to the past, but, but they would think that everybody was nuts because everybody's walking around on the street having animated conversations with thin air, you know, Yeah, <laughs> with all their <laughs> hidden earbuds. So a uh, little esoterica in the world of podcasts and air America, which I mentioned, Mark Marin was a host of one of the shows on air America radio. And if you go to the origin of Mark Marin's what the fuck podcast, which is hugely popular, it began in the studio of air America believe it or not, when Air America cratered, Mark Marin pivoted and recorded his first podcast at Air America, what was Air America Studios. Wow. that It's interesting to think about, because I did listen to Air America um, when it was on, so I was one of, one, of the, one of the few people who did. We were hugely popular, <laughs> believe it or not. Yeah. And I listened to, so I used to listen to uh, uh, Majority Report, and uh, when... Jen when Janine was on it, right? And um, it's interesting now because, like, as an experiment to try to um, compete with uh, right-wing conservative radio, 
uh, it's seen as a failure. But it, now you look back at him like, oh, it actually was a, an incubator. It was a lab for where all of these other, where these major media figures who would go on in other mediums to become huge and did not defeat conservative AM radio. But now I, I saw a thing not too long ago that was talking about car manufacturers. Um, are going. Some of them are going to stop putting uh, AM, FM radios in cars and how it could be a devastating blow to right-wing uh, conservative radio, along with the fact that their demographic is aging out of existence. Um, but it's interesting the way those turn, because we think of fate, you think of bad luck, you think of circumstances that, um, you know, if, if cars, you know, it's the same way that you can't buy a new car that has a key in the ignition, they all have a button, that if, if it becomes a thing where you can't listen to the radio that way, who knows what kind of effect that will have on that media landscape. So podcasts themselves are strangely suited to that model, right? Because mm -hmm. they do, they're out there, they're evergreen, they they sit and, and kind of gather momentum. Did you have that experience working with uh, doing Dead Eyes? Um, well, because, you know, uh, um, within the, like, New York improv comedy scene, once I sort of had a kind of a profile here and I was known at the various, like, places that the networks that make podcasts, the various companies, every now and then, you know, you'd come in for a meeting and people would be like, what ideas do you have for podcasts? And, you know, I would pitch a handful of ideas and Dead Eyes was always one of them. It was always the one that I kind of thought was the best idea and people would laugh and people would get engaged and then they would kind of brush it off. And then, uh, it wasn't until, um, Harry Nelson, who was at Earwolf at the time, um, he, w I pitched it to him and he's like, let's make a pilot. Let's like do it. That sounds great. Uh, I later, and I was like, I've always credited him as like, he was the first person who was any position to actually make it happen. Uh, cause I didn't know how to make a podcast like that. You know, I, I know how to talk to a microphone, but I don't know how to make a properly like produced podcast on my own. And, um, I always credited Harry as, uh, he's the first one who got it. He's the first one who like believed in me. Uh, he later told me that he just wanted me to like him. So he would have said yes to anything. Um, which is a great, which is a great thing to learn that like that. I'm glad that he wanted that because the, it turned out well for, for both of us. And so, uh, Harry, you know, we made a pilot at Earwolf and, and it did quite well. And then Earwolf decided they didn't want to do it. And then, um, my friend Ben Schwartz, um, I was, I basically, there was a point where I put out the bat signal because I was writing all these podcast companies saying, I have this pilot that has Darcy Carden and Zach Woods. And I have a second episode that isn't released yet that has John Hamm. And here's what the idea is. And I, so I had like proof of concept. I had, here's this like review in Vulture that's saying this is one of the more interesting new podcasts on the horizon. And I couldn't get anybody, like everybody was like not interested. They either didn't email me back or they, they said no. And then Ben Schwartz said, do you want me to talk to Jake and Amir over at HeadGum and vouch for you? And I was like, yeah, absolutely. Because I, I was like, I was just going to record it on my phone if I had to. I was just going to, like, um, do, like, that Anchor app where you can just instantly edit your podcast on your phone and upload it with their ads or whatever. I, I was just going to make it happen one way or the other. And then HeadGum liked it. And then they gave me uh, uh, another producer who came into it, Mike Comite, who really was, like, um, so, like, uh, detail-oriented. He works for Ira Glass now, Um uh, doing serial in this American life. And now I had this great like production team and also a network that basically said, we trust you. We like you. Headgum never listened to an episode before we uploaded it. There was never, um, they were just like, we trust what you're doing. They literally would find out what's in the episode when we would upload it on, you know, one o'clock in the morning or something on a Wednesday night. And, you know, it just completely worked out. We had total freedom to do what we wanted and also our own, like, timeline to just, you know, when 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 the when the season was ready, it was ready because a lot of... It was really, for most of the three seasons, it was just the three of us that we were the entire team. There was nobody else 
working on it. Where were you recording? Initially, I was recording at HeadGum, had an office in um, Williamsburg, and I would go record stuff there. But then when the pandemic hit, I was in my parents' house in Missouri, so I'd make like a blanket, like a blanket for it. And then when I got back to New York, still during like early pandemic, um, there was no going in, everything was on Zoom. And I uh, had this, you know, a setup where I just record from home. And, and then, and then, so it was the three of us doing those first two seasons. And then we brought in, we had to bring in a third producer for the third season, uh, Jordan Allen, who really saved the show in a way because we were so burned out. Um, Cause it was, especially Mike was just like, he's such a talented, like perfectionist, which those two things are such a deadly combination when you have a high level of skill and a high standard that you absolutely have to hold yourself to. And he would hold me to it as well. I would be like, I think it's fine. He'd be like, it absolutely isn't. There was a whole episode that we finished. And and this actually, there was a funny thing at one point. There was a whole episode we had finished. And then Harry would sort of be the one who would, he would always come in uh, at a certain point in the process. And we'd be sort of like, we, we think we've got it. And Harry would be like what about this? And he'd sort of pull out a thread and I'd be like, Harry, if, if we change that, it changes the whole episode. And he'd be like, yeah, but, and, and then it would, we'd have to, there was one episode we basically had to redo the whole thing. We were done. We were done. And I was like, it's fine. And they were like, it's not funny enough. I said, they don't all have to be funny. It could just be interesting. Which episode? Can you tell us? Yeah, it was um, actually the last interview we recorded for season three was Nikki Glazer. Because we had done an episode, I was fixated on doing an episode just about eyes as a topic. And we had talked to multiple guests who were experts. But then we had this episode that was just like a doctor and a, and a, someone who was like, does professional like readings of people's eyes. And they, but they were all like not comedy guests. They were all like expert opinion guests. And... They were like, we need something funny. And N Nikki Glazer had gone on another podcast like a year earlier and recommended it. She said, I'm listening to this thing, Dead Eyes. And she was like, I looked him up and he kind of does have dead eyes. And so I was like, we can get Nikki to come in and roast me and basically tie that episode together. And and it was a it was way more fun as an episode. But it was, I still think about it, like we were done. Like we were locked. And then Harry was like, you know, it could be a lot funnier if we had a funny guest in the episode because your writing is so good on dead eyes some of the mm -hmm. you know the way you close out the sort of commentary and the philosophical um tropes that you go on and things at what point did you begin writing those in or was it a concept from the start um when i first did the pilot and this sort of set a template for how we do it i wrote the first episode was basically a monologue and then we recorded that and then harry was like we need to bring someone in and have you just tell the story to a friend of yours, even if they already know the story. Just we need this to be conversational. Right now, it's just a block of text. It was just the original. My first draft of the pilot was just thirty minutes of me telling the story, and then, and then Harry was like, "We should bring someone in." And I said, "Well, let's get let's get my friend Darcy Carden to come in because she's great." She knows the story, but we can have a natural conversation about it. We don't have to pretend. I hate it when podcasts pretend. I hate the device of, um, you know, you have the interview go like, so tell me, uh, Michael, uh, this podcast is about is about fate, but but how many episodes are there? You know, like, and you, like, pretend that you don't know. And so you can go, oh, well, there's, this, you know, and um, so I had this conversation with Darcy, and then we could, then we rewrite the, narration so we could use it sparingly when needed as a connective thing and that sort of became the template for usually i would write a version of the episode first and none of that almost none of that would ever make it into the final episode like i'd write a script of the episode that we would use as a thing to tear apart so we could replace it with interviews and like just getting that out there kind of gave you a, yeah. a through line it, it was a foundation, but it was also like when you have something that's not quite right, it's easier to fix it than when you have nothing and you're just going to start with good. You know, like you have something that's like, I kind of want it to be like this. And then maybe it will still have the same shape, but maybe it will have a completely different shape. But we needed that first 
uh, like base coat of what is the episode. And then, we, I mean, as you can probably tell from, from well, you, you know me and everything, that in conversation, I tend to talk in large blocks of texts. You know? I'm not someone who's like a sentence and then a, you say a sentence. I, I tend to talk long. And so what we, we figured out a really good trick early on, which is when I was doing the interviews, the questions would sometimes be several minutes of me talking. <laughs> People mirror that. Like it's a sort, of, sort of thing where it's like, if I'm revealing stuff about myself and my thoughts and things like that, it actually makes the other person very comfortable be like, oh, well now it's my turn. And then they unload everything. And then we edit out my question and replace it with voiceover where I say, so tell me about your thoughts about this. And then they, uh, you know, just like a, 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 a torrent of thoughts come out. And the end result is very listenable because it sounds like I'm such a good interviewer. And then the narration would usually come last. We would sort of write that to frame what we already had and to set up what we already had. So it was a very... Um, you'd sort of like chip away at, at something and then build it back up again. And it was a very like painstaking process because early on my producers would be, um, you know, we'd have an episode and I think this is great. And then like Harry would be like, I think it's great. Yeah. I think we could probably lose maybe 10 minutes. I'd be like 10 minutes, but all this is all good stuff. What are we going to do? We're going to have to cut good stuff out. And then by the end of season three, I, I, they had sort of trained me mentally where I was saying, I think we can lose some more. and Because early on, I was like, just release the unedited interviews. They're interesting. People will want to hear this. And they were very correct and like, it'll be better if we edit it just down to what's really good. And by the end, they were like, let's leave it in. It's fun. I was like, we can lose it. We could, we could actually lose another 30 seconds if we cut out this really funny part. And, uh, and they were sort of like, no, nah, it'd be fun to keep it in. We sort of swapped personalities a little bit through influencing each other, I think. Whose idea was the mix, the tape of all the outtakes, the, the sort of wash, washed up on a desert island? Two things. It, it was, I was lobbying for like, we got to like get some of these. There was a, a story in the Holmes Osborne episode about when he was on the West Wing and Aaron Sorkin was rewriting stuff. And... They were rewriting, he had like a huge monologue and they kept rewriting it and they kept not getting him the sides. And he had invented a device for industrial films, which was a, a cassette player that you could control with a, a button in your shoe or in your pocket and the little earpiece, but you could start and stop it. So you could um, control it, would, you could catch up and you could control the pace of it. And it was just this great story about how he basically fooled the West Wing production into thinking that he had memorized this thing in like two minutes um, when he was actually using this secret device. And I was like, we got to get this into an episode. And then we got to, I think it was Christmas of 2020 and we were really up against it where we were going to have to like work through the holidays in a bad way. And then I think Mike was like, let's do, we could do a clip episode. And I think it was Mike's idea that it, that I could be uh, on a desert island with the tapes washing up. Um, so, as, and then we're like, it'll just be a deleted scenes episode. And then, um, and then we brought in Eugene Cordero to be the voice of uh, Wilson, the uh, the uh, volleyball, who has never been voiced in any other medium. It's the first, uh, but I, I just wanted to have Eugene on there because he's so funny, and it was. Uh, it was such an easy, fun thing to have him to just, that was one of the few times where it was just like having an improviser on to just play a character and improvise with me. Did you well, study philosophy? Are you, a, are you a philosophy person? I've read some and I've taken classes, but um, not, not in any, like a, a class here or there in high school and college. Did um, the character Professor Towers in, in the cards connect i mean were there things in those lectures that you were hearing that you were like my god the attitude certainly reminded me of various like i didn't have a lot of, i didn't have a lot of philosophy classes but i had a lot of drama classes and a lot of acting coaches and teachers and professors and so the the ego and the aggression uh is certainly familiar to me 
Um, I had a number of, of acting professors who were, you know, absolutely out of control. There was a, I had a one drama teacher who did all these acting exercises, um, that were, I later found out there was one acting exercise we did that a number of people in the class were sort of having real like emotional problems doing this thing. And he had adapted this. It wasn't an acting exercise. It was actually a psychological torture exercise that he had read about that the, the Viet, the Viet Cong had apparently uh, used this on prisoners of war. And he'd like barely adapted it for uh, acting students. Um, And it was just like, it was like a thing where you stand in a circle and um, everyone in the circle has their eyes closed or they're blindfolded. I, we didn't use actual blindfolds. You're standing there with your eyes closed. And so you'd be saying, Michael, are you there? And you'd say yes back. But then the other half of the class are the captors. And every now and then, if they tapped Michael on the shoulder, uh, he, could, he was dead and he couldn't say anything anymore. So suddenly I'd be saying, Michael, and Michael wouldn't be responding anymore. And... It sounds maybe silly as an exercise, but when you're doing it for hours, you start to get to a place where you're like, because then they're also doing things like they're clapping or screaming in your ear or like they're, they're doing things to like make you feel, uh, sensorily, uh, um, under pressure. I don't think that produces actors who are like, well, let's hire this person. Kevin. Yeah. At at what point did you know that Connor was so what you said earlier, Connor, was, you know, when someone sends you something, you you prefer to know who it is, right? Uh, yeah. If you're going to be involved in a project. And that's what I said to Michael when we started doing it. I was like, look, I want this to be friends and family. Like, there's no, we have no time for rehearsal. We don't have time to bullshit around, getting to know you. I want us to all have some sort of connection to the people. And um, w- within reason, you know, so, which is mostly what happened um you know Stephen Boyer was connected to Shane Reddick uh I I've known Lila Robbins for a gazillion years um Michael knew Jamie Ann and then you know Michael's wife Nancy who's a wonderful actor played several parts my wife who's also a wonderful actor played several parts on and on and on but we were stumped (laughs) like when we when Michael's like I think we can go I think we got the money I think we can go and I'm like oh okay what do we do? Because we still have no idea who to cast in this role. And we're like, we're like thinking and thinking and thinking and thinking and thinking. And then he, he texts me. He said, have you ever listened to the, the the podcast Dead Eyes? And I said, no. He said, listen to it. I'm like, okay. Uh, so I listened to it. And I, I swear to God, I was like halfway, maybe 10 minutes into the first episode. And I was like, this is it. This is the guy. This is the guy. Uh, because in the wrong hands... Gil can come off as being maybe Gil might come off being whiny or sad sacky or something like that. And what I did love about, about dead eyes is that you, you had this very difficult thing happen to you, but you still had this sort of great attitude, positive attitude. And I loved your vocal quality and all that stuff. So then I listened to another episode and another episode and I'm like, Michael, we gotta get this guy. I said, but it's tricky because we don't really have a connection to you and Mm -hmm. i'll I'll also say is you know knowing that you were an improv guy i was worried (laughs) Mm -hmm. you're going to come in and like a lot of film actors do sort of treat the script as sort of like oh it's sort of a you know guidepost and just right riffing and stuff like that um so that was a bit of a of a worry uh and then i then i found that we you and i had a connection to uh our mutual friend molly lloyd and i'm like okay I'm, i'm like grasping onto straws i'm like okay well, if Molly's friends with him, he must be cool. And um, so, yeah, so that's when we we pitched you. And I, and I bet we only gave you one or two scripts. There's one person or two people to mention in this thread uh, of of how we how we got Connor Ratliff, the great Connor Ratliff, to do this lead role. Uh, Sally Kid Holmes, who's managing director at at uh, Next Chapter Podcast. We have a meeting every week. We talk about you know what's what's up you know, and what we're trying to do and what we're trying to accomplish here. And just in casual conversation, she said, oh my God, have you ever heard the podcast Dead Eyes? And she said, you know, I hadn't listened to it. And she said, you got to start listening. So I I did. And I was, I mean, I was, I was, I was addicted straight off. 
And so, you know, Dead Eyes was in my head. <laughs> I had Dead Eyes. And uh, when we started working on this, it was, for me, a no-brainer. But then we also have a great casting director at Tulsi, Karen Castle. Uh, and, uh, you know, she's amazing, can get can get us uh folks that that we're really hoping to to get lined up in our series whatever we're doing so uh they played a huge part as well and then of course there's connor who said yes here's the part of the magic uh ingredient is that the email says offer that's the first word in the email so you're already off to you're already off to a pretty good start not audition not self-tape not it's just like so i'm like all right you 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 have my interest. Um, and then also I think it was the fact that, like, I read through the thing. It's all looking good. I'm looking for, like, red flags. And uh, Steve Boyer and Lila are already attached to it. And I was, like, I was familiar with their work. So I, I already was, like, well, this can't be terrible or they wouldn't be doing it. You know what I mean? Like, all signs seemed good. It's funny. I had a... Um, I recently, uh, I don't see Molly Lloyd as often as I used to because we used to be on a sketch team at UCB and we do shows every Friday. Um, during one of the promo pitches for this, I got a text from Molly and uh, she said, um, hey, Connor, hope you're doing well. Happened to notice in your Facebook post uh, that the original post says Kevin Anderson instead of Kevin Henderson. Uh, who happens to be an, an old commercial cohort of mine. I'm sure Kevin Anderson would love the credit, whoever he is. And um, and then, uh, but I had just copied and pasted. It was a typo in the actual PR thing. But at first I was like, oh God, what I do? Like, cause I posted it like in the middle of the night. And then I was like, oh, it wasn't my error. It was just me not reading what I had copied and pasted. But Molly was on it. She's got your back completely. Since Dead Eyes, have you had have you noticed a, a change in like the offers that you get? Are you getting different types of, of roles that you weren't getting before? I haven't had like a big thing come in um, where it's like, you're, you know, you're going to be on this TV show or in this movie because we're fans of dead eyes. I I've had the biggest thing I had was I, um, the show, the great North, the animated show on Fox had me for like a two part, guest star was and that was also offer only because they were fans of me on dead eyes and that was one of the most fun things i've done to actually be on like a sunday night primetime fox animated show and i'm like the villain the two-part like villain of these episodes um and it was and i didn't have to read for it they were just like we like you and we want you on the show uh your podcast was also like the one of the, it was one of three jobs I can credit that Dead Eyes has got me. Uh, your podcast, the two part on the Great North, which was also a lot of fun, and uh, Tom Hanks's audiobook, um, of his novel, um, which, which I'm pretty confident would not have happened if I uh, had not done the podcast. Uh, I don't I don't think they would have speculative speculatively reached out and found me. Within the industry, the podcasts, there are a lot more people who know of me now, um, but it's not like I'm famous or anything. It's, uh, it's, I'm known within certain circles. And so you'll get certain people who like, oh, I've written a short film and we're going to be filming in upstate New York for three weeks and there's no money and can you do it? And if I don't know that person, like the quality of that script would have to be off the charts. Great for me to be like, OK, I'll go do a, a SAG new media short that's going to take me away from New York for however long. And but there's always that thing where you look at something and like you're looking for the thing that will either tell you absolutely no, I don't want to do this or absolutely yes, I got to do this. And there was a film yeah, it was 2015, I think, was when this happened. I got an email. It was like, there's this movie. It's a short film. We want you to do it. Um, and it's uh, it's not a lot of money, but we're going to film in L.A. and then in Japan, and we will pay for your, you know, we'll pay for your, like, flight and hotel. You'll be staying, like, in the Airbnb with us and all your your – food, but you're not going to, at the end of it, it's not like you're going to have money at the end of it. You're just going to have been carried through to do this. I thought part of me was like, oh, I hope this guy's like 
clip is terrible, so I can just like be like, oh, I can't do it. It's it's gonna be. But then the his demos were all really good, and so I'm like, oh, I gotta do this. And it was it ended up being this really fascinating, fun experience making the short film. And the short film turned out really well, and uh, but nothing happened from it. It was just anybody who saw it liked this movie, but it didn't really like uh, lead to anything. And then. Uh, earlier this year, I got a, a text uh, from or an email from them. Uh, it was from that director and his producing partner. They're they're a married couple now, and and I got an email from them saying, um, "Hey, are you uh, are you free to talk?" Uh, and I was like busy at the moment, and I was like, uh, "I'm not not right now, but um, here's my like phone number or whatever." And then they called immediately, and I was like, Ugh. "I said I'm busy." <laughs> <laughs> They're like calling me. So I pick up the phone and uh, they said, well, we have you approved for a part in this thing that we're doing with Tina Fey. And I'm thinking, oh, it's a great. I'll be in the background of like a Capital One commercial or something. That'll be a good few days work. And then it was the Mean Girls uh, movie musical. And most of the people who were in that are, you know, uh, Tim Meadows or John Hamm or, or Busy Phillips or, or, or there's all these like cameos from like known people who are people who are part of sort of like Tina Fey's like circle of collaborators and people that she's worked with before. And I was the one person that the, this directing team, uh, um, Arturo Perez and uh, Samantha Jane, they were like, can we cast Connor Ratliff in this one little part as a teacher? And it's a great example. And there were, and, and then they're the reason I'm not going to lose my health insurance next year because it was a thing where they needed me for a certain number of days, but they didn't know which days. So they do a thing where they like buy, they buy you out for a couple of weeks and you maybe work some of those days. And it's it and I think of that now and I'm like saying yes to that thing in 2015, which was just to get a free trip to Japan, uh, is actually the only on camera work that I've done. Like, and that's not off of I didn't get that off of Dead Eyes, although I think Dead Eyes probably uh, made it easier for Tina Fey to say, oh, yeah, I know, yeah, I know who that is. I can, you know, th- we'll say yes to this person. I'm friends with uh, um, Bernie Coppell. Yes, Doc from Love Boat. Strange story unto itself, but he he advised me, he's like, I never say no. <laughs> he's like, never say no. <laughs> he's like, if it ends up terrible, no one's going to see it. If it ends up great, you never know where the road takes you, so... I got the same advice when I was starting out and I, st- I, I took non-paying jobs like performing in togas in public parks and things like that. Shouldn't have done it. It's very tricky though, because at this point you can say yes to something and then ruin your month for a thing that you, that doesn't help you make rent. And so really it is one of those things where like, um, like the time commitment, like you guys were on a SAG podcast budget, which, um, was great because it was, it made it so that it was also contributing to towards me not losing my health insurance, you know, and it's and it makes it a lot easier to say yes to a thing when when the closer something is to a favor, the more it has to either be great or you know them in a personal way, and even then, if you know them but it's not something you want to do, it's you know it's hard to say yes to that. You guys made it very easy to say yes to this because uh, you'd written something that was good and you had it, it didn't there were no red flags in terms of like, oh, they don't this is a disorganized. They don't have their shit together. You know, um, I think the the only things that ever went wrong were uh, equipment things, which were all mysterious. And I never thought that was due to a lack of professionalism on anybody's part. It always felt like it's we live in this era where cables and wires and microphones and devices and the signal that's traveling through the air. There's all these variables that like, even someone who knows how to work every machine in the room can be like, something's not, you know, <laughs> you have those, those couple of moments where you're like, we, and, and it's always like, we have to turn everything off and turn it back on again. Every time something like that happened, it felt like it was um, proving the, the, the sort of, theories of the uh, of in the cards correct you know that it 
it always felt like, oh, it's the gods, it's fate, it's, you know, we're being messed with. Were you satisfied with where Gil's journey ended in the series? Do you feel like there's more that Gil has in store? Very often, I'm sort of the first person uh, to jump to the conclusion that my character has more stories just because it'll be like, oh, now you have to write another one and then bring me in and hi- rehire me. Uh, this one did, did, I don't know what, what Kevin's feeling on this is, but like this felt like, sometimes the story feels like, um, oh, you really want this to, like there was some show, oh, there's an Irish TV show called, have you seen Bad Sisters? I really like that show. And it's one of the, and I don't know if they're doing another series of it or not, but given the, na- with no spoilers from it, but given the nature of it, um, at the end of season one, I really had a feeling of like, I hope there isn't a season two because that would mean that these characters that we really like will have to endure more trauma and tragedy. And they're not cops. They're not, you know, it's not like a detective. It's like, oh no, the detective has to, you never feel bad that Columbo's on another murder. It's not like, oh, these murders are ruining his life or whatever, you know, you want to see more. But with Bad Sisters, I was like, another series of this would mean that these characters' lives get fucked up again in a way that I don't want to see. Like, I'm rooting for them. I want the rest of their life to be good. And in a way, I feel that way about Gil, that, like, I would feel very bad if Gil uh, continued to have to battle fate. Was it you, Connor, or was it... I know my wife had this idea as well, but I think you may have had it uh, when we were talking that maybe season two is so everything goes great for Connor now, but everything goes really bad for everybody else because the universe has to exact its its equilibrium somehow. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, where he's like paid it forward in a way that then he feels uh, responsible to solve. Yeah, um, I mean, if, if Gil's fate is completely changed, then somebody else's has to counterbalance, right? Yeah, you have to, and you just have to do it until it lands on someone that you're okay with, or you're like, oh, you know what, that guy can uh, be messed with. That's fine. He, that guy had it coming. Well, Connor, when you start when you start fielding all of these offers because of the popularity of In the Cards, which has really been doing fantastic, <laughs> truly, you've probably it's probably been a while since you've played a romantic lead. I would think. Yeah, I don't. I don't know that I ever necessarily have. Uh, I'm trying to think in plays. Normally, I'm the, I'm all of my uh, breakdowns are usually insulting. Um, there, There's always usually... Psycho Killer's on the nice side because at least he's doing what he loves, you know? Um, no, I get a lot of stuff where it's like, look at this loser. Uh, you know, it's just like... I think it's easier to be charming in, a, in an audio medium than in a visual medium just because you have more things that someone could uh, object to. At what point did you know that Dead Eyes was like had broken into new territory for you as a, as a, cause it, cause it really artist. was, I mean, it was super popular amongst, you know, on the inside crowd of, of showbiz folks. Right. I mean, I, I hadn't listened to it, but I had certainly heard about yeah. it. Yeah. It's as far as getting emails, there was a steady, but manageable flow of emails until the end of season three, when the finale episode, um, for various reasons, got a lot of attention and got a lot, got a lot of me, got, got a lot of media coverage and then basically there were so many emails that like I literally every now and then just go into the inbox and I have to just change the date parameter of my apology for taking so long to get back because I've literally been sending emails. I'm like, you wrote this, you know, a year and a half ago. Uh, I'm so sorry uh, that I'm just getting back to you now. Um, it's getting ridiculous now because there are some people who, who like have had – a year and a half of life since they wrote this like uh, appreciative email. You went into this whole career wanting to be an actor. I mean, yeah. then and you you take us through this in Dead Eyes, sort of the journey. Are you now more a uh, stand up comic? Are you uh, a more a uh, serious actor? Do you have? Do you label yourself in that way? I always say actor comedian. Um, I, I, I've never really done stand up. I mostly do improv or various other kinds of like, uh, sort of off, off center sort of comedy things in the New York scene. Um, I was doing a, I was doing a, I was doing a play. I was doing this, I do this thing called the George Lucas talk show where I pretend to be retired filmmaker, George Lucas and have real guests being themselves. And then, um, 
and then I had we had four slots where uh, the actor I was doing the play with, Griffin Newman, he couldn't be there, and we already had booked the play for the full month. So I did four improvised one person shows as George Lucas, um, which went really well. He he just has had such a a an an enormous influence on movie making and storytelling and also has really done what he wanted, you know, and I, I, in pretending to be him, I've gotten to a place where you could name any, your least favorite George Lucas thing. And I can tell you what is like, well, but here's, what's really cool about it. Does in the cards speak to you in, in, in the sense of, in the same way that you draw parallels between, um, you know, your journey on dead eyes, this thing that happened and, and sort of a, a, an allegory about life, the life of an artist. Does, does in the card speak to you with that same type of multifaceted meaning that, that depth? Yeah. I mean, certainly the fact that like he's in advertising, but he's, he's a, he, and um, he's a creative guy, you know, like he's, he's a guy who it's not like, which I think is one of the things I think if I was, if I'd been reading through that first script and he was like an athlete or something, I think I would have thought, oh, maybe this is, you know, even though it's an audio format, it's not like I can't play other kinds of people. But I instantly found it a more like, oh, this is a good fit. Like I, I could see a universe in which I would have worked in advertising and been one of those guys in the room who's like, let's have fun with this. Let's be, let's be creative. Let's think of what, um, what would be an innovative, because you know, there are people in advertising who are the ones who think up, you know, the ad campaign that everybody finds funny and everybody uh, talks about or thinks is interesting or like, you know, that one commercial in a hundred that you actually stop and look at because you like it as opposed to because you have, you're waiting for the show to come back. That's what I love. I mean, Mad Men, I think, is such an incredible series. The getting to that, that final ad that mm -hmm. sort of changed the world, the Coke ad, right? The journey to that place for one creative and all the people that are part of his life. I, I think it's such an, it's such a brilliant concept. And uh, I, I think that um, anyway, I, I, that's what, that's the mark of, of great art, right? That it can just speak on so many levels and have so many strands that just you can pull at and, and find another story. And, you know, I'm not a spiritual person at all. Um, I think that, but I'm, I, I do think a lot about how difficult it is to know anything about what's going on. There's that show, The Leftovers, it was based on the novel and the premise being that like 2% of the population disappears, like 1% of the population or whatever vanishes and everybody loses their mind. And the show and the novel never explain what happened. And much is made out of like, the idea that like, oh, we never find out what happened. We never find out what was going on. But, you know, if you watch Law and Order, we never find out what's going on there either. We just find out about the crimes. But why do these people exist? Why do, why were humans created? Like every other show that supposedly exists in the world where we understand what's going on, um, we don't. We just know what we can see and what we can experience. But like, we don't know why humans exist on law and order because we don't know why humans exist in reality, you know, but we we're used to that mystery. But if you add one more mystery to it, everybody's like, no, we need this one solved, you know? And so I think about stuff like that all the time, just in terms of like, you know, if there was a God that was like actually invested in what we were doing and paying attention, I have so many more questions about that. Because it'd be like, why? Why would he? Why would they do this? Why would they create something like this? What's their motive? What? And and if they're like, oh, and this god is mad at you for things you did. What? I when I was in high school, I took a a, a class. There was a class called the Bible as Literature, and it was really a, a a way. It was a loophole to have a Bible class in a public school, but the rules were you couldn't teach it as scripture. You had to teach it as if this was a book. This is like. David Copperfield or of Mice and Men. It's just a just a story, just a bunch of stuff that somebody wrote in a book. It's such a fascinating psychological document in terms of storytelling and in terms of 
people trying to make sense of things. Um, I do think that like almost any children's book that is published nowadays has most of the same lessons in it. Like you can, you can most, most children's authors that are worth their salt manage to get in most of the messages about kindness and mercy, compassion, like the important stuff is everywhere. And then, but the Bible has like all this extra stuff that's like either completely weird and irrelevant or like actually hugely like troubling and, you know, and uh, bizarre because you, you, you're you trying to make sense of the world and you think of a story like Noah's Ark, which that's one of the, that's one of the hit singles. The connection, I mean, the fact that you're uh, fascinated by the Bible uh, and, and, you know, that you were drawn to in the cards where there is, it is biblical in the sense of how Gil, Gil's relationship with the universe is really like an Old Testament figure's relationship with God. It's a, it's a Job story. It's a, it's a, it's a Job story. And Job, that's one of the best. That's one of the, it's not a, that's a, it's not a hit single, uh, but it's one of the, it's one of the best stories in terms of like, if you really want to understand what this book is, um, you know, the devil makes a bet with God about his favorite person <laughs> that God, like I've always thought, I, I've always had an idea that you can make a really good modern horror movie version of the story of Job. Um, you could just take the beats of that story. But the thing that I think, but the thing that I think my twist on that story is, you know, in the actual story, the happy ending is we killed your family killed your wife, we killed your kids, killed all your livestock. But then at the end, because you proved you were such a good boy, God's good boy, um, you get a new wife, you have new kids, you get new livestock, and you're made whole again. And I, and I always think, it's such a, certainly from a modern sensibility, it's the most fucked up thing I've ever heard. That it's like, hey, we we're just kidding around. But guess what? going to make you good as new, give you a new wife. It's not, he's magical. He could bring the old wife back. He can make, snap, it never happened. I don't know why he can't do that. It never happened. It was a hallucination. He, it was a virtual, it was a simulation. God can't do simulations. He had to actually kill the real wife, kill all the real kids, kill all the real livestock. But then you get it all back. And I always think that last shot of Job with his new wife, his new kids, his new livestock, happy family, everything about it looks like, from the surface, it's a it's a big wide shot to blow of like Job has his life back, and then you sort of push in almost like the almost like the way you push in on the photo at the end of The Shining, and you get closer and closer to Job until you get to just close enough that you can see that this man has not forgotten what was done to him. This man is not made whole. This man has been ruined by uh, an all powerful force that treated everything that was dear to him like it was just pieces on a on a game board kevin henderson yes we have the seed for season two of in the cards oh, very God. dark a very dark term <laughs> yeah, season two will not be a comedy it will be a horror gill yeah, gill is be. gonna go <laughs> out with the vengeance and make things right in his own way yeah, if you liked funny games, you'll love season two of In the Cards. Uh, the the it's become like a full on Lars von Trier uh, nightmare. I um I also think I have this thought about heaven, which is um the idea of it in terms of how it would work. That like everybody good supposed to go to heaven, but let's say there's some really good person out there and she uh she has a kid and the kid turns out to be you know jeffrey Dahmer or, or mussolini or who know you know somebody and she goes to heaven but of course it won't be heaven to her if her boy doesn't come to heaven but it can't be heaven for all the people that her boy hurts or killed or massacred or whatever so you either need to zonk her out to the point where she forgets her son. It's a hard reboot. Like, you'll never remember. So it's, it's not really her anymore. You have to either take that or you have to drug her or you have to create a version of heaven where her boy is there with her. But for everybody else, he's really burning in hell. You know, you have to 
sort of almost create a heaven that's individually like uh, um, almost like an illusion for everybody. Like it's almost you. It, it immediately gets so complicated. You can't even. It can't just be a place where we all go. We create our heaven or our hell here, and and that's sort of that is that's what heaven and hell are we either we either make life a living hell or we we can make it heavenly for ourselves i have a i have another heaven problem for you yeah so let's say there is heaven okay now say <sighs> you're a guy or a girl and so let's say you're a guy you got married with the the love of your life when you were 22 the love of your life you had a beautiful marriage but it was cut short when she fell off of a cliff when <laughs> When you were 30. So you had eight years of a fantastic life. You mourned and mourned and mourned. And then, you know, five, six, seven, eight years later, you, you found somebody else. And it's she's fantastic. And now you have another love of your life. And you have a wonderful marriage. You live out the rest of your lives. And then you both die. Okay, so now you go to heaven. <laughs> No, <laughs> now you go to heaven, and you're like, okay, now I got Choose. two of them who were the love of my life. It's it's like a horror show. I I, no, I worry about things like that them. too. You're just you yeah, take both of them. Heaven then is the set of uh, Three's Company uh, on one of the episodes where Jack Tripper has multiple dates in the Roper's apartment and Larry's apartment and theirs, and you have to run. Is he seeing them on the sly? I mean, do do the women know about each other and? There's that there's that kind of um by now sort of like one of Spielberg's more obscure movies that movie Always did you ever see that I have not seen it's, that one It's um Richard Dreyfuss and Holly Hunter are uh married I think or they're definitely in love I can't remember if maybe they hadn't gotten married yet but he's like a um like a forest ranger forest fire service and he dies and then he he comes back to her as a ghost and he basically won't won't let her move on. Um, there's specifically a scene where, like, he's, like, trying to thwart her moving on. There's a scene where she's, like, asleep and he's, like, in bed with her, like, as a... She can feel his presence and he's, like, saying to her, like, I'll always be here for you. You'll never need anyone but me. It's really... And there's that other... There's another great... There's another great movie that's... Um, have you ever seen Truly Madly Deeply? Oh, it's a beautiful yeah, film. A great Love movie. that film. Uh, such a good movie. We have done it, my friends. Dead eyes to truly madly deeply through in the cards. And we have incorporated the Bible. We have incorporated philosophy, heaven, hell, the afterlife, the panopticon. We've done it all. We've covered everything, all thanks to in the cards. And still so many que so many unanswered questions. There's yes. so many. We need to do another. We need to do another bonus interview with you, Connor. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, that would, okay, but before we go today... Um, it's only fitting, I think, to ask. Uh, uh, we know your story, uh, Connor. Uh, Kevin. Yeah. Did you ever meet Tom Hanks? I ha I have not met Tom Hanks, but I did meet Michael Caine, and that's almost as good. I saw Tom Hanks once. You did at a Greek Orthodox church. Oh, really? <laughs> when you were seven <laughs> in Los Angeles, he just he just he just and he in. was I didn't know who he was because he was filming Castaway. Oh. And I, there was this homeless guy in the that front was, row. That was that was, and he during, was looking. He looked yeah. really greasy. And I was like, "How did that guy sit in the front row? Did he have the beard? He had the beard and long hair. That was months, mere months before uh, me getting fired. Then, wow! Yeah, if I had only, period. if I could go back in time and touch his robes as he walked past me. <laughs> yeah, if you had said, if you had said, "Don't fire anyone," uh, from Band of Brothers, don't fire anyone. And said it in a way where he felt, uh, and then like maybe uh, um, uh, acted like you were getting a message. Then he might not have fired me, and then I wouldn't have done Dead Eyes, and then I wouldn't have been casted in the cards, and we wouldn't be here now. You're exactly right. Uh, this was the greatest conversation in the history of conversations on podcasts ever. Thank you so much, both of you. Uh, you've been listening to In the Cards bonus content series. You can learn more about In the Cards at Next Chapter Podcast website, ncpodcast.com. That's N as in next, C as in chapter, podcast with an S at the end, dot com, where you can find other series like the Play On podcast series and interviews along with talk podcasts like The 500, Indecent with Kiki Anderson, Beef with Bridget Todd, and a whole lot more. 
I'd like to thank Jeremiah Tittle, the founder of Next Chapter Podcast, and our producer, Pete Musto. Our audio engineer, editor, and sound designer is Justin Cortese. Be sure to subscribe to Next Chapter Podcast for updates on all the latest content. And don't forget to rate and review our shows. It really helps. Right, Connor? It really does. I'm Michael Goodfriend. I look forward to sharing more incredible works with you along the way with lots of enlightening bonus content at Next Chapter Podcast. <laughs>